And we are live. Hello. My name is Rachel Barenbaum. I'm the author of A Bend in the Stars. And today I am so unbelievably honored and totally fangirling because I have the one and only Honoré Fanon Jeffers, whose incredible, amazing debut novel just dropped. It's called The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. I absolutely devoured every page of this 800-page magnum opus. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you here. Honor, welcome to Debut Spotlight. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, I'm so thrilled to have you. So before we get started and jump into my questions, I just want to introduce you to my guests, um, because this is your debut novel, but not your first publication. But we're going to go through your unbelievable bio for just a minute, because this just will blow everybody away, including me. So um, Honoré is a poet, essayist, and novelist. She's the author of five critically acclaimed books of poetry. Her latest, The Age of Phyllis, won the 2021 NAACP Image Award for Literary Work, Poetry, was long listed for the 2020 National Book Award in Poetry, was a finalist for both the 2021 Penn Vocal Award and the 2021 LA Times Book Prize in Poetry. The Age of Phyllis was chosen as the common read for the Scholarly Conference Society of Early Americanists for the academic year of 2020 to 21. We're not done yet. Hold on. We still got another paragraph. This is unbelievable. Honoré has won fellowships from the American Antiquarian Society, the Aspen Summer Words Conference, Breadloaf, McDowell, NEA, Rona Jaffe, Vermont Studio Center, and the Witterbiner Foundation through the Library of Congress. In consideration of Honoré's scholarly research on Phyllis Wheatley Peters, it was unbelievable. She was elected to the American Antiquarian Society, a learned organization to which 14 U.S. presidents have been elected. She's won the 2018 Harper Lee Award for Literary Distinction, and in 2020, she was inducted into the Alabama Writers Hall of Fame. Honoré is a professor of English at the University of Oklahoma in Norman, where she has been teaching since 2002. Now we have something to add because today she hit the New York Times bestseller list. She has been receiving starred reviews, even from Kirkus, from everyone around, rave reviews compared to Toni Morrison. Might I say better than Toni Morrison? No, <laughs> never. 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 Okay. Never it. <laughs> all right. All right. Never better. But certainly their names have been uttered in the same sentence. She is an unbelievable writer, and I'm thrilled to have her here. Honoré, can you please tell me what is the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois about? Well, this novel is about, it's a multi-generational epic, and it's in two parts. One part is we follow mostly the coming of age of Ailey Pearl Garfield from the time that she is a little girl, three or four years old, until her 30s. And all of her joys and sorrows and struggles, while they intersect with her learning what it means to be a Black woman in America and all of those political and personal uh, realities that that all entails. The other part of the novel is we get to know Ailey's ancestors from the time of the 18th century, um, some of whom Ailey will never know their names, but we get to know them and their story as they have lived on this piece, same piece of land in central Georgia that began as a Native American village, a Creek village called the place in the middle of the tall trees. And then now in the 20th century and moving forward, it is um, a farm or actually in the 19th century and moving forward, it's a farm in a town called Chickasetta, Georgia. So we learn this and then the story intersects and then it moves away, it converges, diverges, and then finally everything sort of comes together at the end. And we won't have any spoilers, please, after page 325. Um, there are a lot of people that are giving spoilers. I'm like, please don't do that. But they, <laughs> they are. They're like, the book is so long, it doesn't matter. I'm like, yes, it does. It doesn't, yes. it doesn't yeah, no. matter. And I'm seeing such beautiful comments 
Um, hello, Carla. Hi from <laughs> Alabama. And thank you, Ricky Brody, for reading the book. Um, right. So Ron Charles, right? Washington Post oh, called wow. it magnificent. What a review of a lifetime. <laughs> how did that business? <laughs> how did that feel? Oh my God. <laughs> um it was not only Ron Charles, it was also Veronica Chambers of the New York Times. The yes. two of them really take no prisoners. You know, they are very straight, no chaser. And when Mr. Charles started, you know, the review, whatever I need to do to get you to read this book, I nearly fainted. And when Veronica Chambers said, you know, I haven't read a book this good in a really, really long time. And the thing that I think kind of shocked me about both of these is that usually when you read a review in one of the big, you know, Washington Post, New York Times, um, there's always that sort of mitigating paragraph. Yeah. You know, even when they're being nice. Right. There's like, one paragraph of something you could have changed or made yeah, better. Yeah, mm -hmm. something, you know, this was filled with da, 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 a little bit too much exposition. Da, 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 da. And, you know, I'm, I'm fine. As long as somebody doesn't punch me in the throat and tell me, <laughs> you know, you need another job. You know? <laughs> Don't give up your day job, you know. Um, I'm pretty good. I kept going back over the review, like, where's the mitigating paragraph? And there wasn't in either one of them. And that was just so wonderful. Of course, I happy cried. I'm a happy crier. I will happy cry. Unabashedly, <laughs> I will happy cry. So it was, it was beautiful. And what's even more beautiful is, you know, you have the reviewers. And the reviewers are people who've studied literature for a really long time. And I'm not saying my readers haven't, but I wanted to know what do people who don't review books for a living think of it? And so it's just, it's, it's just been incredible to this, this overwhelming, this outpouring. It feels like I've told people, it feels like a miraculous fever dream. No. <laughs> Usually the fever dreams are horrible. You have alligators crawling up the walls or whatever. But in this case, I'm, I'm just so pleased and so grateful that people have really taken this book to heart. Well, really, I mean, the work shows too, right? This was not something that you just whipped out. All the work that you put into that is now paying off. I mean, it is unbelievable the research that you did to make this happen. And I think that's what people are reacting to also. So I want to dive into the book now and get okay. to some of the good stuff. Um, and so I really wanted to ask you, I have to ask you about Ailey's family. And um, I understand that her voice came to you, these characters, right? They lived with you as you were in a graduate program in Chickasetta. And they came to you in your dreams with these lyrical voices. Can Late. you talk Later. Yeah. Great. Sorry. I love that. So I wanted to ask you, can you talk about like sort of when they came to you and how, how they feel living in you as real characters? Well, I, I've been writing Chickasetta stories for since grad school. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm an older dame. Uh, <laughs> so I'm four. And um, I've been writing Chickasetta stories since like 1994 or something like that. Um, when I... Um, got my agent, Sarah Burns, all I ever wanted to do was write stories. And she was like, there's no money in that. <laughs> Never. I mean, she's straight, no chaser. I love her. She's, she's fierce. Mm -hmm. okay? She is fierce. And she's right. She's right. She's a firecracker. <laughs> and we are very beloved and close now because we've been together since 2005. So I, I lied to her that I was going to write a novel. But I had no intention of writing a novel. I just was going to write some linked short stories. And so I wrote, I'd been writing about Ailey's mom, Belle. I wrote a failed short story, but some of it made it into the novel. But so what happened was I was, I was like, okay, I'm going to write, you know, a, an Ailey um, novel. And it was really just supposed to be a beach read. It was <laughs> I would not call this a beach read. People always <laughs> laugh. They're like, what? Yes, that does yeah. not compute. It's supposed to be a beach read. Light, you okay. know, light kind of 
you know, cute. I can't see it, but okay. I'm going to go with you. Sassy, right. And so <laughs> then that's when the dreams started happening. Wow. That's when the dreams, probably about two or three years into my faux novel writing, which what would happen is I would, I would write something and then, um, and then I would send it to Sarah and she would say, oh, this is beautiful. Where's this going? I don't see any plot here. How, how is this going to move forward? And, you know, she always said, you know, how's this going to move forward? And um, the other thing is, you know, Sarah and I weren't talking very often because, you know, she pretty much, I mean, she's a mom. So she has three children. So she knew I was lying. And uh, she, she knew. And, uh, but she always said, you're, you're, you're brilliant and you're going to make some money one day, but you know how your mom will say, they're just, you know, you come home from elementary school, they're teasing you because you're pretty. <laughs> you're right. So that's what I was like. She's just doing that mom thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's been probably two or three years into the faux novel writing is when I started having these women. And I would wow. see a plantation house in the distance. Everything that is on that farm, when you, you know, the plantation, then it becomes a farm after, um, after uh, uh, the end of the Civil War. The Emancipation Proclamation did not actually free enslaved African Americans. It was not until, you know, after the war. And I, I would see it all. And I would wake up. And uh, sometimes mo in the beginning, I couldn't remember what they said to me. But then, I guess maybe six months, a year's time. I never thought that I should be writing any of this down, right? So maybe, you know, run along, run along, as I say. And I woke up one day and I could hear everything. And so I just started writing them down. And then probably maybe six months to a year after that, I knew these were Ailey's ancestors. Wow. That hard work began. Wow. Because I had this Ailey story, which was still supposed to be a beach read. <laughs> I still can't even believe you're saying that. <laughs> Everybody thinks I'm lying. I swear it was supposed to be a beach read. Well, beach reads sell. Right. So. And I love a good beach read. Who, yeah. Who doesn't? Right. Who doesn't? It's supposed to be a beach read. And then this very serious story about Native Americans, you know, the 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 Creek people and enslaved African Americans. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I began to think about how to impose craft uh, onto the, the historical portions, which were coming to me far easier. Uh -huh. it, was, it was just like breathing that I was trying to figure out how to connect these two different. And, and, and that's when I thought of a framework of mirroring right, of generational mm -hmm. trauma. I have to tell you that the discussions that are happening um, with Oprah's, Oprah's book club on Instagram and Facebook are really helping me <laughs> to dive into my own novel, right? Because you don't really think about the themes and all of that until after you're done, right? right? right and so cause... that's what happened. I began to think about mirroring these two and to think about generational trauma, but not simply pain, but overcoming the pain. I love it. Mm -hmm. So um, another thing that you framed the book with that I would love to touch on if we can mm -hmm. is uh, Du Bois' theory on uh, double consciousness. Right. Yes. This idea that there is a sensitivity, you write, that every African-American poses in order to survive. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say that I saw that in almost every single character. Right. Two mm -hmm. sides to them. The mm -hmm. hidden side versus mm -hmm. what is shown to the outside or what you might know on paper versus right from a family tree versus what is the real character. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could just talk about that for a little bit and tell us your thoughts around this double consciousness. Well. The, the thing is, is that the uh, Dr. Du Bois's theory of double consciousness says that African-Americans 
always think of themselves in two ways. First, how they view themselves. And second, how the white world views them. Keeping in mind that when Dr. Du Bois was born, it was 1868. Okay. So one of the things that I found very interesting, um, and of course, there are other portions of his work that go through the book as well. But one of the things that I thought about is double consciousness, not only the way that Dr. Du Bois talks about it, but in the way that every human being has a duality. Mm-hmm. Each of us has a road within that can go left or can go right. I don't believe that people are born evil. I think that's a cop out. I think that each of us decides, but there's not a big moment where you say, hey, I'm going to become a war criminal today. Or I'm going to, you know, there are incremental moments that we all have. And that's what I was thinking of in this country with these characters in this region in, in this country, how did we get to this place? It's not a big thing. It's a small thing. And, and that's what history is. There are little teeny moments that add up. But when you're looking back as a student of history, it's so obvious how this happens. Yeah. But that's where being a novelist comes in because then you look at the characters and you, and you see what they become. I love that. So sort of in this theme, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Ailey's voice. Um, so she's a young black girl and who, her parents are middle class and uh, intellectually privileged. Right. Yeah. And uh, but she really feels this pull between the working class side, the Chickasetta roots, right, versus the city side mm-hmm. and what her parents want her to be like. And I thought that you framed it perfectly um, in a conversation with Miss Rose, um, where uh, Miss Rose says, uh, just seen something. I always have knew about rabbits. Sorry, my accent is so northeastern. It's, it's <laughs> and so, okay. but I'm just going to go with it. If you could go with me for a minute. All right. <laughs> just seemed something I always have knew about rabbits. Hand me that there bucket. Then we go to Ailey's head, and she says, "I pretended I didn't hear the broken verb, That's right?" Great. Um, She says, I've been in the city. My mother and Nana ruthlessly corrected my grammar, but down south, I wasn't supposed to get above myself. There'd be trouble if I insulted an elder. And right there, you see for her this push and pull between these two worlds. This push and pull, but also the way that African-Americans of my age and maybe 10 years back, how we were reared. Everybody was, if you lived further north, at one point I lived in in North Carolina, then after my parents separated when I was 14, we moved to Atlanta. So the city, I don't know, because I was a kid. I know Atlanta. I learned how to drive in Atlanta. I did all of that. But we, but that's a, a real tradition among African-Americans who live further north. They will send their children down south every summer. You learn culture. You learn food ways. You learn how to talk to elders. I was not reared calling elders Annie or what you always put a miss on that. If you did not know their last name, you would say Miss Veronica, Miss Betty, or Mr. Beale, or whatever. So there's Mm -hmm. all of that. There's also, you do not correct an elder, okay? Now there's another side to that, right? If you're having to get away from them, if they're doing something abusive to you, right? Mm -hmm. That's a very difficult situation. But in its best way, you do not correct elders, right? I remember Mm -hmm. one time I said to my aunt, ooh, my aunt Tweet, I was like, grandma's ignorant. You know, the way that she talks and she was like, don't you ever, you know, it was like, bam, right? Yeah. You that know, would not go over in my family either, by the way. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, no other people, Italians, Irish, people who come from, I mean, African-Americans clearly were involuntary, you know, immigrants, right? But people who come from immigrant backgrounds, right? Re, you know, there is the old country, 
Mm -hmm. And then there is the, and so there's that push and that pull. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, Ailey is learning this, you know, as she goes along. Yeah. I love it. All right. So I want to talk about one other section. I just, these are like two of my favorite parts of the book and there are no spoilers, but I just want to bring them up because I want to talk about that. We're going to go for it. So we're going to talk about feminism. And I think there are two parts because I saw a universal feminism. And then I want to ask you about black feminism. Um, Right. But the universal feminism, we'll start there because this really um, rang true to me. um, And I think probably a lot of readers and we see this is Ailey's on the porch with Uncle Root. And um, Uncle Root says, what did he do? This is right after she's had an amorous moment with the boy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, And so then you describe her as thoughts. And she says, there was no way I could tell him what had happened out at the creek, that I'd been naked when David and I had our falling out. There was no way to tell him about what happened with Gandhi either, that all this time I'd broken my promise to everybody. I wasn't really a good girl. I never had been. I just pretended to make everybody else happy and look where that had gotten me. I had a broken heart and I was still ashamed. Mm-hmm. And right. And this, this is just a beautiful passage. And this moment of, mm-hmm. I had just been pretending I wasn't really a good girl. Mm-hmm. There's so much packed into that in, on, a, on a universal feminist level. Mm-hmm. Um, can you just talk about that paragraph? This is like my dream to ask you this. <laughs> well, well, one of the things I feel like with all feminists, and again, because Sarah and I have been together for so long and we're now very close, Sarah is a hardcore feminist, okay? And she's an Irish lady, Irish American, okay? And the thing about it is, is that there is your political feminism, you know, your political principles, And then there is how you're walking in the world. Mm -hmm. And patriarchy is always there trying to knock you off your feminist principles, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly if you are heterosexual, cisgender, and and you're a, 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 a cisgender woman who dates men, who wants to be married. There are always these gender roles that you grew up with in the larger society. And so there's always this sort of push and pull. The notion of a good girl, I mean, that's the thing. You have people who are feminist and they have their particular feminist notions, but then there's that patriarchal devil. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's- that's Be a good girl. Good, be a good girl. You know, you're mm-hmm. not supposed to sleep with too many men. You're mm-hmm. not supposed to, you know, there's all of that. So that's that universal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just caught that so well. And then, um, you know, you also have this other level here of black female empowerment. Um, and you've talked a lot about, you know, the, what the, the term strong black woman yes. really, right. Is applying, it is applying to a woman has to be, um, right. Deal with it, stand for her family as well as herself, right. That there's more than a layer of just standing up and being the good girl. It's a, it's a bigger term. And I loved how you talked about that and would love to hear you talk more about that. Well, the whole thing about Black feminism is mm-hmm. that, first of all, the, the, the notion of wife and family and all of that, that cult of domesticity of the 19th century, that was for middle and upper middle class white women. It did not mm-hmm. include poor white women. It did mm-hmm. not include Black women or other women of color. It was for mm-hmm. sp- specific group. Black women have never been covered by patriarchy, right? Even though patriarchy, I don't ever think is a good thing, but there's never been a moment where we've been called the weaker sex or any of that, right? So there's always that tug of war in Black communities because patriarchy, weirdly enough, has been aspirational, for, for black community. Oh my God. It's right. like a it's it's a nightmare, but it's yes. inspirational, like like you know, this is this is among you know sexist people, but this is the dream <laughs> that right. black women can be 
put on that pedestal the same way white women are not working, you know, doing that mm -hmm. whole thing. And so that's one part of that tug of war, right, of Black feminism. But, but the other thing is, is that particularly with Black feminism and the term that was coined by Alice Walker, womanism, mm -hmm. is that you're not just concerned about Black women. You are concerned about the entire community. Mm -hmm. oh, children, yeah. Black men. You got to think about everybody, not just yourself. And so God, that's such a weight. Such a weight. It's a huge, it's a huge weight. And then on top of that, people are policing your tone. People mm -hmm. are, you know, you're angry or, you know, or, and the whole strong black woman is, as I've, you know, written elsewhere is yeah. about, um, uh, um, black women having to constantly improvise to keep their children safe, to keep themselves safe. And many times to keep black men safe. So mm -hmm. when we think about the quint, that quintessential sort of, identity, we can look at someone like Ida B. Wells Burnett, who mm -hmm. was very much about women's rights, but also an anti-lynching mm -hmm. crusader. Mm -hmm. And the majority, 90 something percent of black people who were lynched during the Jim Crow era were black men. So mm -hmm. you've got to take care of everybody. And typically you come last. Right, <laughs> right, right. right come last right and we see that in the book yeah where, where there yes, are these we do. constant you know who do you protect to keep the community together mm -hmm. who is going to get thrown under that historical bus right to keep everybody together that's mm -hmm. what black feminism is about in a nutshell I love that you're opening up this conversation and I hope that it will continue many more times because it's important to, I think, distinguish and talk about the different aspects of feminism and what it means, right, mm -hmm. to different people. Um, okay, so I have to go academic on you for, okay. just, <laughs> for just one question um, because I love that you bring Professor Hartman's term of critical fabulation in, Yes, right? I love, um, I'm a stand for, for, um, for Sadia Hartman. I, I, I worship her. Don't yeah. Me. I mean, it's pretty amazing. And I love the idea um, because, uh, so basically I guess what it is is that you have to sort of fill in history, right? You have a bunch of ideas, but then to make them real, to make history come alive, you have to sort of fill in these other parts to make them into real characters. And um, I felt like you opened the book by giving a narrative of the family history, saying this person had, it was sort of biblical in a sense of like this person got with this person. Oh, really? It was like a black biblical litany. Thank yes. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad that, yes, so I read that right away. Um, and then you sort of wrote the book, filling in all those characters, right, afterwards. And I just loved that as a way to think about history and family, because I think that's not articulated often enough. So I wanted to ask you to talk more about it. You already, I'm so glad that I had, you know, touched on something that was important to you. Well, the thing about Black history um, and Afro-Indigenous history, if you are African-American and you have Indigenous ancestry, much of that is gone. Um, you're not going to find a paper trail. You right. may have an oral history that is very small. And one of the things that I find really interesting is people, people are like... Um, is this an autobiographical novel, right? And it's it's not. But what's everyone what's, asks that, right? Everyone asks that. I think it's not just me. But what I think is beautiful is that people feel my love for these folks, and it seems real, and it is real because, in a very real way, I created a genealogy, a family. And I filled in blanks that I will uh, about, you know, history that I will never know. And so that's what the songs are about. And that's also why the, the narrators of the song is the collective God, you know, a, a bunch of gods of the of the land 
because they know what Ailey will never know. Mm -hmm. Ailey doesn't find out everything about, about, you know, her family. She will not. only know a little bit, but mm -hmm. the land knows. And I thought about with Deborah Miranda, um, the great Native American scholar and poet talked about her body being an archive, right? Beautiful. So the land is an archive. The body is an archive. The blood is an archive, right? Mm -hmm. But as a, as a, um, as a as a as a a real historical moment that will never be known but mm -hmm. as professor hartman talks about you know you you the critical fabulation you leap into that and that's what a that's what a creative writer can do you can leap into it and that's why when you read uh, Professor Hartman's work, it's very scholarly and, and rigorous, but it reads like a novel. I'm thinking of um, Lose Your Mother and then the, the other one, which of course, um, uh, Premenopausal Brain Fog, I forgot. <laughs> the one that, that came out, Wayward Lives. Wayward Lives, right? Okay. And I have that one as well. It reads beautifully like the best fiction. Yeah, I think the best history does. You know, yes. and that's why I love that theory and these ideas and how you really pulled that together. So, um, okay, so we are almost out of time, but I have to ask you two more questions. All right, we'll just, we'll try to fit them in quickly. Okay. I wish I had another hour with you, by the way, because well, I think you're one just day amazing. in the after time of the period. Oh my God, I would love that. Yeah. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask, what is the hardest part about publishing? Wow. I have listeners ask this all the time for advice. Like, what I did you really hard, struggle with? The hardest part about publishing is when you, so I'm a faithful person. Okay. That doesn't mean everybody has to be, but the, that your time is not God's time. And so there are people who, you know, don't read poetry. So for them, I try not to get cranky when um, people say, like someone said, uh, Miss Oprah uh, plucked, you know, plucks people out of obscurity. And I'm like, I wasn't obscure. You are not obscure. I would not say that I about you. You're, you know, but, but to most people I was. Okay, mm -hmm. let's keep it real. And so when you're, you're, you know, working hard and you didn't have, you know, won many awards and all of that. But there's, there's a, there's a place that, you know, when you're young, you think about ascending to. And when you haven't, and you don't know if you ever will, it, it's, it's very hard to remain classy, <laughs> you know, and I was a jealous heifer. <laughs> oh, I, I find that hard to believe. It, it was bad. When I was wow. in my thirties, ooh, ooh, it was not a good look. And so the thing about it is, is that you have to think about, you know, it, it it's coming. And sometimes to keep it real, it may come after you've left this earthly plane. And so, you know, and now that all of this attention has come to me, now I'm on the other side of it. And I'm like, wow, I wasn't prepared for this. Right. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. It's beautiful. But right. I, wow, this is a lot, you know, um, right. for me being a Southern woman, I'm just used to saying, thank you. Thank you so much. Blah, blah, blah. And so then, you know, you just like hundreds of people, you're doing this, but I can't stop because that's my training, you know? So right. one of the hardest parts, remaining committed to your work. The other part is, with fiction, because there is money to be made, mm -hmm. you have to. For the very lucky authors who work very hard and write beautifully with talent like yours. <laughs> you're sweet. You're so sweet. Remember now, we're talking. You're we're talking 15 years mm -hmm. when I got my agent. And this book coming in. I love that you're reminding us about that. Yes. Right. 15 now, years, not an overnight 15 success. 15 years when I had far more moisture in my skin. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and so what happens is 
when you really, you know, you want to make money. Some of us have student loan debt. I have student loan debt, you know, Mm -hmm. so it's hard for you to keep to your vision because you want that, you, you, you want that acclaim and all of that, but you have to. And for me, fortunately, I found an editor, the great Aaron Wicks at Harper, um, who saw my vision and we were, we were one on this vision. And she is not African-American. She's a young white woman and just wonderful, you know, and I just love her so much. And, um, and, and I just want her to be my editor forever, you know, literally. But, but um, you have to be true to yourself. And that is very difficult when there's money on the table. But what people see now is the vision that I had, that yeah. I did not sacrifice. And that's the hard part. But I hope that I w- will be a model for not only people to keep to their vision, but also older women. I, I've seen I've seen during this pandemic, older women realizing their dreams. This is our time. Oh my God. I just love what you're saying so much. It's just, this is our time. This is amazing. And thank you for being so open and sharing. It's just, I think this is what you do in the book. For those that are listening that have not read the book, this is why people are following, falling in love with the love songs of W.B. Du Bois, right? This honesty, this heart on the page is what Honoré has really done. And it's amazing. So if you have a very short answer for our last question, um, (laughs) listen. If you can do it. If not, I'm ready to listen as long as you want to talk. (laughs) Um, And you've answered a little bit here, but um, people want to know what advice do you have for a new struggling writer, um, writer, someone who's hanging on and, you know, is in the middle of their 15 year journey? I think I love you back. I think (laughs) that um, you need to be remain and study on your craft. Full stop. Amazing. You stay, just keep on your craft. That mm-hmm. will increase your confidence level, right? And so that is what I did. I studied, I remained on my craft. And so then again, I had that confidence and that allowed me to stay true to my vision. Amazing. All right. Honore, if you could just stay on for one more minute, I'm going to end our broadcast and sign off. Although I got to say, I'm so sad to be leaving you and I'm going to hold you to meeting in real life one day when we're through this. So I want to remind everybody the amazing, incredible book that we're talking about today, Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. Go out, run, and buy yourself a copy and read this. Honoré, thank you so, so much for joining us today. May you sell many, many copies. And to my listeners out there, may I see you on the next broadcast. Thank you. Thank you.